read me romance read read me romance read me romance read read me romance you could take a look in a book that's fine or you could sit back relax and unwind and read me romance read read me romance welcome back lady listeners hey lady listeners welcome to the second installment of bite me by mel jean brooke thanks for hanging out with us we're super excited to have her with us this week we love 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 her so thanks mick um let's see i do want to mention before we get into it too far to don't forget to enter this week's giveaway she is giving away 10 copies of the kraken king and if you like this one, she wanted us to mention that she also has a book called Frozen by Mel Jean Brooke that's in Kindle Unlimited, before I forget. And that was the one that, like, he's a giant and he's too big to fuck her. <laughs> I love the cover of The Kraken King. It's so it's, pretty. I'm upset. It's so pretty. And this um, has an audio and everything, guys, so I'll link that all up. This is a serious book, mm-hmm. but if you read <laughs> – yeah. Millivane, you're down mm-hmm. for that. Yeah, I was going to say, like, Millivane, her A Gathering of Dragons series, the first one, I wanted to get it right. I didn't want to, like, mess up which one's which. Um, a Heart of Blood and Ashes is book one, and A Touch of Stone and Snow is book two. And she's got the other one, A Dance of Smoke and Steel, that I think may come out later this year. It just depends on when, um, I think, when it comes out, but, like, the due date. But, um those first two books, I think each, maybe each time they came out, they were like my favorite book that year. Mm-hmm. Like when they, I mean, and I, I love Mel Jean. I love her writing. You know, I think she's an awesome person, but to separate the person from the book, like I have author friends that I love that haven't written my favorite books. You know, I just really like them as people. She wrote the best series. Like it is fantastic if you like fantasy at all this is the book for you like if you enjoyed like Akatar or jennifer l armantrout her like i forget what that blood and ash books if you liked any of those any sort of fantasy in that genre a gathering of dragons is phenomenal i can't recommend it enough and also like even if you haven't like gotten into that this is a great way to sort of get into because it's not a ton of books you know there's only two that are out right now they can be you know they need to be both be read but it's like kind of like each couple has their own book so it's not like you have to you know go through it the whole thing with the same people so it's not it doesn't feel as big but she's got a great way of just sort of like throwing you in the world but it doesn't feel super overwhelming yeah so I can't recommend Melivane enough. Like I've just absolutely loved her books and the audios are fantastic in those. I want to actually want to look it up and see who the narrator is because I, I think I even went and found the narrator's other books. Mm-hmm. It is Nicole Poole. Okay. So I loved her so much. Like I went through and searched all of her audio books because they're just so good. And I think these books are super long in audio. I mean, they're probably like, Oh, it says 12 hours. So, yeah. Yeah, I was going to guess. They're like pretty 14. heavy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, if you like what you're hearing today um, from Mel Jean Brooke, like I said, you can go check all that other stuff out. I have lady listener emails. We got a couple sure. over the break that I wanted to read. So, I'll try to do this as long as my throat holds out. <laughs> all right. Let's start with this one. Um, It just says ADD. Hey, y'all, I just wanted to share. I'm on episode 117.2, and you're talking about the ADD testing you're going through. I wanted to share that I have ADD. I was tested as a kid and diagnosed then. It was all done through the school system, but that was when I lived in Texas and their public school system, so I don't remember all the testing, but but it was determined I have ADD and not ADHD. There is a difference. Yeah. I must say, you talking about all the things linked to ADD is something I have never heard before. Since I was a child, I think they focused more on how to help me in school as opposed to how to help me psychologically. So hearing you talk about it made me made so much sense. And when thinking about it in relation to myself, I will probably not talk to my doctor about it because I deal fine. My dad took a tough love, protective stance of, I need to learn to deal since the world won't care about my problems. He's not wrong. So even though it was hard, I'm glad I didn't end up relying on meds. 
to each their own though. My point of this story is I've gotten to the point in my life where I don't even think about it on a daily basis so much, um, so much so that my husband found out like a year ago after we got married, I didn't realize I hadn't told him he was talking about it and explaining it. So I deadpan stare at him and say, I know I have it. He looked at me shocked as shit. And then like a damn light bulb flipped on. He said, that actually makes a lot of sense. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, hubby. Appreciate it. Y'all have a good day. Keep up the good work. It's cold as shit in Michigan right now, Sam. <laughs> it's cold as shit everywhere. I know. You know, uh, you know, it's it's amazing to me how with ADD how people manage it. Yeah. Because, you know, this is something that you and I talked about a lot where it's like, is this an issue that I have that I've just learned to cope with? that I've learned to do all these other things around to deal with it? Or is it, you know, is it not? Like, what is it? You know, because you all, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I always second guess where I'm like, do I really have this or am I just lazy? Or it's like, oh, no, maybe you've just set up your entire world to do things this way. I think you know? most women do that in a lot of things, especially when it comes to mental health. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, something that um, my therapist said that really made me, you know, give myself a little more compassion is that think of meds as a toolbox. And she was like, inside your toolbox, you can have all kinds of options. And you don't have to use all the tools. Not every job requires every tool. But sometimes you need a tool to get the job done. Yep. And that's okay. And so that's what I think of my medicine as, you know, with me my brain will not function the same if I don't take it. That's just, I'm missing a component in my chemicals in my head that will not be the same if I don't take it. So that's part of it. It's like in order for me to function at my best each day, I need tools for my soul box. So I kind of look at it like that. So I get that, you know, not everybody is going to obviously use the same method. Like that doesn't work like that. So there you go. I like that. Um, this is entitled Proposal Story. Okay, y'all. Way back when you said proposal stories are always welcome, so I thought you might like mine since it's one I can't really share with many. Oh, God. Keep in <laughs> mind, we already owned a house together, so marriage was the next natural step. So at the end of July in 2016, we were going to a friend's wedding. Oh, 2016. Remember those days? <laughs> We were so naive. I know. <laughs> we were going to a friend's wedding about an hour from our house. I like gum, but seems to but I seem to be the only person who has car gum. So I searched my man's car for gum, opening the glove box, and he oh, flips God. out because under the ring box is a mint. I, of course, see no ring box, just the mint. I was debating eating when the, eating then decided against it because he was telling me it was really old and trying to close the glove box on my hand so fast forward to the reception my boss was watching the kids and had said that she was happy to keep them overnight we should just enjoy ourselves for me this was the checkered flag waving open bar and no kids till the next afternoon i'm down <laughs> Ah, this is going to be terrible. Mommy, I know this because I went through this. <laughs> My man ah. told me after the fact that he didn't want to do it at the wedding and take any spotlight. Then thought about the parking lot, but it was it was gravel, so that was a no-go. On the hour-long drive home, I lay the back seat. I lay in the back seat and closed my eyes. I didn't sleep, just resting my eyes. No worries. My man made sure I couldn't fall asleep and kept poking at me and asking if I was awake. So when we get home, I'm drunk and stupid tired. I get up to our room, stripped naked, and flop down face first on the bed. My poor man is pacing around and says, I wasn't sure when to do this, so here it goes. <laughs> still face down on my pillow and naked and he asked me to marry him i crack one eye open at him say something sounding affirmative and pass out <laughs> <laughs> like throw your thumb up sure babe this is amazing the <laughs> next morning while barfing my guts out he asked if i remembered i said yes of course i never forget anything when i've been drinking and he let out a relieved breath because he didn't want to have to redo it then he fetched me new pants since I peed a bit while barfing. Thanks, kids. <laughs> this is so real. Oh, my God. Is this Leah? 
I hope y'all got a good laugh from this. I know I do. Keep up the great work. I truly enjoy all you do. Even though I'm still behind on the episodes, I always leave with more books to read. Oh, you can say my name, Sam. Oh, it's a different one. Hold on. Is this the same? I don't know if it's the same one. I don't think it is. Oh, my God. That's so real. Because I'm at the point when I vomit now, I pee on myself. Like, it's just, I don't know if it's kids or it's just sporty or what. Like, it's, that's just what I do now. Oh, Although I don't really vomit that often. So thank God. Oh my God. So that's so real. That sounds so much like my proposal. We went to a wedding. I was, I got shit tanked at the open bar. I was sloppy drunk and my husband was just proposed to me like in an alley. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This one is entitled tree in the bathroom. Hello. So when we do our bathroom, I totally want to get a small two or three foot tree to put on a shelf. I live in Michigan, another Michigan, this is not Sam again, (laughs) Michigan, where we have a huge ass store called Bronner's, B-R-O-N-N-O-R-S, and it's literally the size of a small mall. That's all Christmas. Whoa. Why have I never been to the store? I've never heard of it. I haven't either. We got to go to Michigan now. (laughs) They have everything there, and I've already seen quite a few cute ornaments for bathrooms and even kitchens. I totally want to have a tree in every room. I haven't had a chance to go all crazy with Christmas yet. Um, yet. Um, the ten, in the 10 years that I've been with my husband, because of money or because of no space to store anything. But this year we got a house with storage. He tells me that he's so happy. I'm not one of those crazy people when it comes to Christmas. She has a bunch of side eyes. <laughs> Baby, we just haven't had the right space. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been on TikTok for a while or been looking at the people I follow. So when I heard last week's episode about your trees, I went over real quick and I love them. LOL. Send it to my husband and everything. Ha <laughs> ha. Love you all and hope you have a great Thanksgiving. I'll find out in a minute. <laughs> have a great Christmas. <laughs> Alyssa, she didn't say we couldn't say it. How long did it take you to pack all that crap up? A day. Hey, damn. Let's see. So this is, I've got a system. Okay. So each tree has its own bin. And yeah. the shit okay. I put on it, like I don't put anything breakable. Like they don't, well, the family tree has like our heirloom ornaments, like all the ones yeah. the kids made and stuff. That one I'm more careful about. But the rest of them, it's like I put like the big bin, just rip the ornaments off, toss them in there, take them to the basement. Okay. Like it's the, the hardest part other than taking them all downstairs, like, I mean, it's like 10 trips, you know, down to the basement. It's taking all the lights off the snow village. That's the longest part because you have to like be really careful about unhooking the lights from the back of them. And so like that takes a while and packing up the houses. But my oldest daughter actually helped me this year. And I was like, fuck yeah, now it's time. These kids are finally paying off. (laughs) <laughs> but you know that fucking tree video had 600,000 views. Yeah. Because it was it's a like, cute idea. It is a cute idea. But listen to me. You look so rich no with sense. all that toilet paper on there. I know, right? That, <laughs> that's that it was an embarrassment of riches. <laughs> because there were so many rolls of toilet paper on it. <sighs> but you know, this is the thing about TikTok. I don't understand. Like, that. I don't know, I don't know how to algorithm. I don't know how to, to really get into it. Like, I'm, I'm not utilizing that way it, I should. For Alexa, right? Like, I'm really not. Like, I should make more videos about the books we have and where to get them. And I just feel like maybe I need a, someone to help me do these things. But I don't, because I see, like, it is, you know, the friends that we have. And they're like, Willow Winters, she had her discreet series, went viral. It got viewed like two million times. Yeah. You know, which is awesome because her books are incredible. Incredible. And she deserves so much attention, you know, and there's other authors on it, like Katie Robichaux, like Kayla, she absolutely deserves to have her book seen and loved by all these hundreds of thousands of people, which is an awesome. I'm so happy, but I'm like, I mean, I don't, you know, not taking away from anything. It's like, okay, so how do I reach our audience, you know, like what's the best way to reach the people who want to read our books? This is and when that's I the so old. Yeah, yeah, I really <laughs> do. Yeah. <clears throat> because I think I go into this spiral of like, oh, I should make a TikTok and post one. And when it's like, I have to spend my time writing, mm-hmm. like, you know, like what's the trade off? Yeah. So 
I don't know. Maybe I'm just not like equipped enough to, you know, I got, I figured out Snapchat and then they fucking changed it and I quit. And then I figured out Instagram and now everybody's going to TikTok. So it's like, I have to either like move with it or disappear. All these kids I think are on Snap. Like my kid does not text. Yes. Like they don't use Mm -hmm. text messages. Yeah. That really fucking bothers me. It really, really bothers me that people use Snapchat. They just, all their texts, she'll miss my text. She's like, mm-hmm. oh, I forget to, like, she, I forget to check that app. Like, texting is uh-huh. an app. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Like, how? But, yeah, like, my niece, that's all she did all weekend was send 50,000 snaps. Mm-hmm. Every two seconds she's sending one. And she's 16. I mean, I guess this is what you do. But, like, I'm just... I don't know. Like, I don't understand it. First of all, the messages disappear, which is a huge red flag for me. Because I'm like, if you want your messages to disappear, what the fuck are you hiding? That's what I want to know immediately. I don't know. At that age, I probably don't want to see the stupid shit I said. No, you don't. But, like, I guess I look at it, like, as a parent. That really makes me nervous. Like, how do you, like, I don't know. Like, I just kind of have this thing where I'm like, I'm either just going to say absolutely no social media. Like, I don't know. I don't know how to do it. But I feel like you're opening up Pandora's box when you allow them to have a single social, any of them, any of them, it opens up Pandora's box. But then I always, you just roll into that. Then when you shelter them too much, when they get their freedom, it's like, Mm -hmm. ah. I know that that's the thing is like, I don't want to prevent them from doing things. And prevent them from going places and living their life and having experiences. It worries me about the content and the negativity, the body shaming, like the the self-importance, the images, the the jealousy. Like that's the FOMO. That's what I worry about more than anything. Because that emotional fucking up, that takes years to undo. And it doesn't even mean anything. Like, you're not no. even hanging with these people in 10 years. Nope. Exactly. And it's like, I worry, too, about, like, what about, like, sending nude pictures? Like, what does that do now? Like, like that can scar someone forever. Because you were, you know, you trusted a boy. Yep. You know, and you sent him a photo. And then it's like, now everybody has it. Like, just that one slip. And I guess that could happen anywhere. But... I don't know. I mean, you can't put them in a bubble, and I understand that. But I can also not hand them a box of dynamite. Yeah. Like, I feel like that's where I'm at. And and granted, my kids are 10 and and 7. Maybe something. By the time they're old enough to have social media, it'll be some new app. They don't even know how to fucking use. I'm just saying my daughter's a lesbian. (laughs) No. (laughs) A hundred percent. I hope that. His voice. I hope both of mine come to me and like I'm a lesbian. I'm like, thank God. I'm just so Ooh, glad I don't have to deal with it. Dodge. Like, do you still want to have the birth control talk? Or are we good? Okay. Mm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. That's what I hope. Anyways, I just I hope they they find a lovely woman and they settle down. Because all of her friends. So actually, when she was younger, she had a lot of guy friends. Remember? Yeah. But yeah. She's like, all of her friends are girls now. Girls are awesome. All of them, except one, and he's gay. <laughs> I think once you get to the point where you realize girls are your friends and not your competition, mm-hmm. that's when the second half of your life starts. It is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. let's play the second half of Bite Me by right. Mel Jean Brooke. We'll see you guys on the other side. Bye. Chapter 5. Emma. Emma was still half asleep when she heard Nathan come home. She turned, buried her face in her pillow, and listened to Letty ask him about the investigation, the status of the Jeep, and whether he preferred rolls or biscuits with the beef stew she was making. Then she sent him from the kitchen with an instruction to wake the princess who had slept the day away. The princess thought she deserved all the sleep she had had. Emma had run more than 50 miles that morning. After she had left Nathan by the highway, she had searched through a quarter of the town trying to track down the murderer by scent. Unfortunately, she hadn't found any sign of him. Nathan didn't knock. She held her breath as he came inside the room, locked the door, and moved to the bed. He pulled off his boots and slipped in next to her. You're awake, he said, his voice low in her ear. She nodded, 
fighting the sudden need that was tearing through her and the growl that came with it. We got closer to him today. Nathan shifted slightly, snuck his arm beneath her ribs and hugged her to his broad, warm chest. We got a fingerprint, sent it into the state lab. Hopefully they'll come up with a match. Any guy with a missing thumb is going to have some explaining to do. Emma forced the need away, found her voice. It won't be missing for long. It'll grow back. And that story will be a lot harder to sell to a jury than the one you have for this morning. The silence that fell was heavy, painful. Nathan didn't move. She couldn't see him, had no idea what he was thinking. But at least he didn't let her go. Finally, he pulled her closer, his jaw rough with a day's growth of beard scratched lightly over her cheek. This morning, I thought I was having some kind of spiritual experience. The kind people have a few weeks before they play naked chicken with a train. So if you're saying what I think you're saying, it's a lot less worrying than thinking I've lost my mind. Emma could only nod again, her relief a shuddery ache in her chest. But Nathan didn't let her off the hook. If you're saying it, Emma, then say it. She swallowed past the tightness in her throat. It was me. This morning, the wolf you saw was me. I showed you which logging road he drove down, and I dug his thumb out of the snow. Christ. He muffled a laugh against her neck. You've got one hell of a bite. Yes, but it also means that he's going to become what I am, just like I changed after I was bit by that wolf five years ago. His fingers drifted over the unblemished skin at her temple. You do heal fast. Does it hurt now when I touch you here? No. She caught his hand. It would only hurt if you didn't touch me. There's no chance of that. His lips ghosted over her ear, her jaw, then her fingers, where she held his hand against her neck. His other arm tightened around her waist. This is why five years ago you didn't come back. I was afraid, she admitted. General fear, or are there specifics I should know about? There were specifics. I'd lose whole chunks of time, wake up outside, and it was harder to fight myself when I wanted something. Like she wanted Nathan. And I didn't want to accidentally hurt anyone. But now... I learned to control it better. And the more I let it, the wolf, out, the more control I have when I'm human. Unable to help herself, Emma arched her back and rubbed her ass against him, then choked out an embarrassed laugh. But my control still isn't perfect. His hand moved down to her hip, stroked the length of her thigh. I like the idea of you losing control. From the thick evidence blatantly present, She'd already realized that. Emma let go of his hand, twisted her fingers in the sheets. She didn't have much practice at controlling arousal, but her nails didn't rip the cotton, thank God. Her hips worked back against his cock, and she panted. We can't. Nathan stilled. Now or ever? Now. I hear Aunt Letty coming up the stairs. He groaned against her neck. Emma laughed, but it was cut short when he rolled her over and fastened his lips to hers. Oh, God, he tasted so good, smelled so good, felt so good. She pushed her fingers into his hair, opened her mouth to the slick heat of his tongue. His hips pushed between her thighs, and he rocked forward once, twice, grinding the hard ridge of his arousal against her wet, needy flesh. Her breath caught on each movement, her body aching to be filled with his. But it wouldn't be now. With a growl that sounded as feral as hers, Nathan lifted himself away and pushed off the bed. He stood in his khaki uniform pants and shirt, his hair disheveled, his breathing ragged and heavy. Not even a werewolf, yet he had to fight himself as hard as she did. Warmth swept through her, curved her lips. Sheriff Studley. She turned onto her side, propped herself up on her elbow. That does have a better ring to it than Deputy Studley. A teasing nickname she had given him her first summer here, when they had met and had an instant strong connection with each other. 
But at 16, she had been too young for anything except a platonic relationship with a man just out of college. No wonder they'd fallen into the we're just friends rut. Both of them, afraid to change and risk the friendship they had formed that first year. And both of them longing for that change. They'd both gotten change in a big way. Nathan dragged a hand over his face, finally looking away from her. You knew to call me that last night. You knew that I was the sheriff now. Letty told you about the election. I keep up on the news here. Well, what they didn't mention was that most people voted me in on the name recognition. They saw Forrester and checked the ballot, forgetting that my dad was heading off to Arizona to retire, so they were actually getting Forrester Jr. His smile became wry. The past 18 months haven't been such a fine addition to his legacy, have they? Emma sat up. What does that mean? It means there are four women dead, and their murderer is still out there. So, your dad just retired at the right time. She cocked her head, studying him. There was more than just anger and frustration in him. There was shame, too. Is this why you weren't burning up the highway to Seattle? He stared back at her. You tilted your head just like that this morning. Give me the same damn look. When she didn't answer, he shoved his hands into his pockets. All right. So uh, I wanted to have something to offer you first. If he had just walked through her door and offered himself, that would have been enough. But she had stayed away because she had had her own demons to fight. Demons that he'd easily accepted. So she couldn't just tell him that his demons didn't matter. She slipped off the bed, rose to her toes to press a quick kiss to his mouth. So we find him. We. Yes, we. And don't argue, she said when he looked ready to do just that. I bit him. That means right now, whoever he is, he's probably fighting himself. And doing what he most craves, which is apparently raping and killing, will be hard to resist. Nathan watched her, his expression dark. He'd already been waiting less time between attacks. So it'll get worse as those urges increase, and then it'll get even worse, because he'll be stronger, faster. And the longer he's a werewolf, the more he learns, the harder he'll be to stop. So what do you suggest we do? Emma tapped her finger against her nose. Sniff him out before he gets too comfortable in his new skin. I know what he smells like, and this is a small town. I can cover a lot of ground in a night. I bet. Nathan paused, considering her. All right, then. Let's go catch a bad guy. Chapter 6 Nathan Time for Emma to sniff out a serial killer. Of course, even though she had changed into a wolf, Nathan didn't let her go alone. His blazer moved slowly down the darkened streets, and from the driver's seat, Nathan watched her flit between the houses, sniffing walkways and doors. Her appearance was raising hell with the dogs in town. A chorus of wild barks came from just about every house she had passed. He'd have a bevy of noise complaints to deal with tomorrow. He put in a call to Osborne, who Nathan had talked into staying at his house with a promise of a home-cooked stew. The deputy reported that Letty had already gone to bed and that he was working through his third bowl. Nathan would probably be rolling him out of there come morning. He watched Emma trot down a side street, staying in the shadows. Now and then, she'd lift her nose, smelling the air before shaking her head. Nathan sighed and took a swig of coffee. They'd likely be out here for hours. And even if Emma identified the bastard, bringing him in would be tricky. No judge would issue a warrant based on a wolf's sense of smell. With luck, the print from the thumb would do it. But if not, Nathan would have to work backwards, find a solid link in the evidence that could have led him to the murderer's front door. He frowned. Bringing a werewolf in was going to be tricky, regardless. It was just past two in the morning when Emma returned to the blazer, her breath billowing in the freezing air. Nathan leaned over, opened the passenger door. She leapt onto the bench seat and lay down with a heavy sigh. 
done for the night. That sense of unreality hit him again. Knowing this wolf was Emma was one thing. Talking to her in this shape was another. She looked up at him, then turned onto her side. The whine that escaped her sent chills down his spine. Her jaw cracked and bulged. Oh, Jesus. He cut the blazer's headlights and pulled off to the deserted roadside. He slid toward her on the seat, then didn't know what the hell to do with his hands. Didn't know if touching her would hurt worse. The transformation took less than a minute, but felt like forever. An eternity filled with her whimpers, the groans of her flesh, and his murmurs that he prayed were helping her, soothing her. Finally, she lay naked on the seat, her dark hair and skin glistening with sweat. It's not so bad, she panted. Once the pain starts, you just ride with it. Speechless, Nathan shook his head. He reached into the back seat for a blanket, tucked it around her shoulders. Thanks. She gratefully accepted the coffee he offered, raised it to her lips with shaking hands. I just need another second. She wasn't exaggerating. By the time she had swallowed the lukewarm drink, her shivers had stopped. She stared unblinkingly out the front windshield, her fingers tapping against the mug. I get a whiff here and there, but it wasn't concentrated anywhere. I think he must move around the town. Maybe he does repairs or some kind of work on call. Work was a reality Nathan could get a grip on. We covered most of the town tonight. It might be he lives on one of the farms or rural properties outside of town and just comes in for whatever it is he does. I can start running those properties tomorrow night. Her lips curved. I'd go during the day, but someone would probably shoot at me. It might be over by tomorrow anyway, if the state comes back with a name on that print. Emma's nod wasn't too convincing. She was likely thinking exactly what he had been earlier. Arresting a werewolf wasn't going to be easy. She tilted her head back and finished off the coffee, placed the mug carefully in the cup holder. Did it help to see me change or make it worse? Nathan didn't even ask how she had known that he was having trouble reconciling his Emma with the wolf. It helps. I'm not saying I've got my head around it yet, but it helps. The transformation is grotesque. His gaze ran up her pale, perfectly human legs. Maybe for a few seconds. What you got on either end sure isn't. Wolf or woman, you're about as beautiful as beautiful gets, Emma. Her eyes locked with his. You were afraid to touch me. I didn't know if it would hurt you. Oh. The tight line of her mouth softened. I thought we'd established it only hurts when you don't touch me. So we would. But not yet. Though the slice of skin and the pale curves of her breasts showing between the edges of the blanket nearly undid him. But it was suddenly real damn clear that Emma thought he'd been afraid to touch her for another reason, as if she believed he might be disgusted by her, as if she feared he might reject her. Is this why you stayed away so long? Nathan asked softly. You thought I might be afraid of you, that I might not want you. She bit her lip, looking suddenly so vulnerable that his heart constricted with the need to hold her, to tell her that he wouldn't let anything hurt her. Maybe that was part of it, she confessed. A little part of it. Not the big part. Emma shook her head, her hair sweeping forward across her cheek, hiding her expression from him. You remember the wolf that attacked me, how vicious it was. So you worried that you would be vicious too. Though her hair still concealed her face, he detected a small nod before she quietly added, especially since my memory blacked out during those first transformations. I didn't know what I did on those nights, but I was mostly afraid of what I might do to you. To me. Because it was so hard to control my impulses and to resist what I wanted. All of a sudden, it seemed impossible for Nathan to take a deep breath. Here he was, worried about hurting her. All the while, she'd been worried about hurting him. 
but that seemed the least important thing he had learned from all of what she had just said. Because despite the friendship and attraction between them, he had thought all the need was on his side. Yet it sounded as if her feelings had matched his. Hoarsely, he asked, Five years ago, you wanted me that bad. I did, she whispered. And now? Emma didn't answer. She didn't need to. Her fingers tucked the curtain of hair away from her face, revealing eyes that glowed with amber fire, burning with need for him. The knowledge roared through Nathan's body like a hurricane, blowing his cock into steel and raging through his blood. A growl ripped from his throat, the hungry sound of primitive response to the needy burn in Emma's eyes. He reached for her and she lunged across the distance between them, straddling his lap. Her mouth found his, then moved to his jaw of where they could sink into the kiss. The blanket dropped away from her shoulders. Her fingers worked frantically down the buttons of his shirt. The luscious softness of her tits filled his hands like a dream. Her frenzied kisses down the side of his neck came to a sudden moaning halt when he pinched the stiffened peaks. Then she about destroyed his control when her tongue flattened against the skin of his throat with a swirling lick. But as good as that felt, Nathan had better use for her mouth. He caught her gorgeous face between his hands, his fingers spearing into her hair and brought her back up for a proper kiss. And he found sheer heaven when he slicked his tongue between her lips, so sweet and hot and slow. But below, Emma's hands were unbuttoning and unzipping and then stroking his rigid flesh with feral urgency, the pleasure of her grip choking the air from his lungs. His hips jerked up and near banged her head on the roof of the truck. His boots slid on the snow-wet floor mat, an icy realization wound around his brain. It damn near killed him to tear his mouth from hers. Not like this, Emma. Emma froze with her hands still wrapped around his cock, her glowing gaze wildly searching his. Not like... how? She said it so warily, like all those doubts about whether he'd been too disgusted to touch her after watching her turn into a wolf were worming their way back into her head. He couldn't let that fear stand even for a moment. Like this, Nathan rasped. In the truck, in a rush. It's sure as hell not how I ought to be fucking you. Not their first time, anyway. Other times, yeah. His imagination had put Emma through the paces in just about every location he had ever been. But this time, she ought to have roses and wine and a bed, at the very least, not the front seat of his truck. Oh, she softened against him and her fingers ran a teasing glide from the base of his cock to the tip, leaving a trail of throbbing need in her wake. How about we go slow next time? Next time, as if she was certain there'd be one. Nathan hadn't been. Though Emma had said she was in town to stay, some part of him still expected her to go. Until now, when she so easily mentioned a next time. But it wouldn't matter either way. If she went again, this time he'd burn up that highway going after her. Because he needed her. He always had. Now he knew that Emma had needed him, too. And they'd already wasted so many damn years. I want your mouth on mine the whole time. Because I haven't kissed you nearly enough yet. He finally said, his voice gruff. But I'll make sure you're all slicked up so you can take every inch. Emma only half obeyed. Her face still cradled in his big hands. She lowered her smiling mouth to his, but didn't wait for him to slick her up. Instead, she began rocking her hips, rubbing all that wet heat up and down the trunk of his erection, sliding and sliding and sliding, until his shaft was dripping with her need, and he was just about out of his mind. But two could play that game. Nathan grabbed her ass, and urged her up until he had her little cunt right where he wanted it, then made her ride the fat head of his cock in a rough, slippery tease, all the while kissing her slow, 
so slow, waiting until he couldn't bear it any longer. Then he pushed inside her, not even an inch, just barely stretching her out, and she gasped a sobbing breath against his mouth. She was scalding hot and so goddamn tight. A blissed-out blur crept around the edges of his vision as he began to work deeper, intending to take his time. But Emma whined low in her throat and swiveled her hips, driving herself down the full length of his cock. And that was damn near the end of him. All that slick heat so fucking snug, clutching at him with every thrust, winding up the lightning that sparked brighter and brighter each time Emma made one of those needy, whimpering sounds, or, God help him, those sexy little growls. His hand dropped down between her thighs to help her along because fuck knew he wasn't going to last. Already he was grunting and fighting against the finish that was boiling down his spine and threatening to erupt. His thumb stroked over her clit, each slick caress more desperate and rough, until Emma's back arched and her nails dug into his shoulders and her inner walls cinched so goddamn tight that there was just nothing for it but letting go, letting that lightning burn through his cock and helplessly fucking, fucking, fucking up into her until there wasn't a single drop left. Chapter 7 Emma Emma hadn't moved since she had collapsed against Nathan's chest, her body limp. She didn't want to move, but she knew she needed to. With a sigh, she reluctantly slid from his lap. Nathan held on for a second before letting her go. Not a word had yet passed between them, but she sensed that he was as thunderstruck as she was. She'd known the sex would be good between them, but being with Nathan had been better than good. It had been sweet and hot, both the long leisurely kiss and the urgent fuck and she felt amazing. Not even trying to suppress the swelling emotion that constricted her throat, Emma reached over the back of the seat for the bag she had stuffed there before they had left his house. As if taking his cue from Emma, searching for her clothes, Nathan buttoned his shirt and shoved the tails into his trousers. I'll call Osborne, let him know we're heading back to the house. His deep voice seemed thick around the edges, as if stuffed full of more emotion than his practical words conveyed. You think Letty will notice if you sleep in my room? She'll notice, Emma said, and Nathan seemed to tense until she added, but she'll get used to the idea. If Letty wasn't already used to the idea, her aunt probably believed that she and Nathan had been together all those years ago, and now they would be. Nathan seemed just as pleased by that thought as Emma was, giving her a quick grin as he lifted the phone to his ear. Emma continued to dress, listening idly as Nathan spoke with Osborne, until she realized she could hear Daisy barking faintly in the background. Emma hurriedly shoved her jeans back down to her ankles. Oh my God, Nathan, get out to your place as fast as you can. Tell Osborne to get into Letty's room and to take his gun. Nathan didn't ask why. He simply swung the blazer onto the road and repeated her instructions to Osborne. As she removed her clothes again, she explained. Daisy was barking. She doesn't do that. She never does that. Except the night after I was bitten. She barked like crazy the first night. Nathan nodded, his lips tight. Despite the two inches of snow that had fallen, a fresh set of tire tracks led down the lane that her aunt shared with the foresters. Oh, shit, Emma whispered, then turned to Nathan. His gaze was fixed on the road. I'm going to change. I'm faster that way, quieter. He's probably still in human shape. And he might have a gun, Nathan said grimly. So don't think you're going anywhere yet. Emma, damn it. She heard his curse, the slam of his fist against the steering wheel, all underscored by the agonizing crack of her bones. Then there was nothing to do but ride out the pain. Chapter 8 Nathan. Letty's place rose up out of the darkness like a gingerbread house frosted with white icing. Nathan glanced over at Emma, who was sitting up with her ears prickled forward. Okay, I agree, 
You're safer in that form. Harder to argue with, too. Emmett turned her head and grinned at him before facing forward again. There's his truck, he said, unsure if Emma's wolf eyesight had picked out the extended cab pickup parked just off the lane. He drove past the house. But did he walk back to Letty's or did he head out on foot to my place? Emma gave an uncertain whine. Nathan pulled up behind the truck and drew his weapon. Stay behind me. He approached the truck slowly and noted the magnetic signs stuck to the door. Fuller's plumbing. He pictured its owner, Mark Fuller, tall, sandy-haired, easygoing, and shook his head. Jesus Christ. He had played ball with Fuller in high school. In all the years since, Nathan had never heard a whisper of trouble connected to Fuller. In a small town like Pine Bluffs, word got around. If Fuller had even looked at a woman sideways, if anyone had ever called him a creep, Nathan probably would have heard of it. But Fuller had managed to stay squeaky clean. Footprints led away from the pickup, heading further off the road into the pine trees. Do you hear anything from inside the cab? Emma shook her head. Nathan checked the truck, found it empty. A bandage, crusted with dry blood, lay crumpled on the passenger seat. What had Fuller thought when the bleeding stopped so quickly and his thumb had begun to heal over? Did he understand what was happening to him? This guy's the right smell. In answer, Emma put her nose to the ground, began following the footprints. Jogging beside her, Nathan realized the prints led to his place. Fuller must have parked here rather than risk anyone at Nathan's house seeing the headlights or hearing the engine. Nathan dialed Osborne's cell and was putting his phone to his ear when gunshots cracked through the night. He broke into a run. Emma streaked ahead. He didn't slow to catch his breath when Osborne answered the phone. Who fired? Nathan asked. That did. It's Mark Fuller hopped up on something. He took off out of the house. Injuries. Not me or Miss Letty, sir. I hit Fuller, but it didn't slow him down. Did he have a weapon? If he did, he didn't use it. All right. Hold your position. We're coming up on the house now. Or Nathan was coming up on the house. Emma wasn't with him anymore. Her tracks followed the footprints across the wide, moonlit clearing that separated his house from the woods, but he didn't see her or Fuller. Where was she? Nathan's breath hissed through his teeth in worry and frustration, but calling out her name wouldn't help either of them right now. Better to settle down and try to get a bead on Fuller. Listening for a disturbance in the snow-muffled quiet, Nathan stopped at the clearing's edge, using the wide trunk and low branches of a pine for cover. The shadows around the house were deep. Anything could be hiding in that darkness. Movement near the back porch caught his eye. It was Fuller. The man was hunched over and using an eerie, loping gait that sent prickles of dread down Nathan's spine. That gait didn't look human or wolf, but simply inhuman. Moonlight reflected in Fuller's eyes as he turned his head. He stopped, straightened, and stared directly at Nathan. Nathan held his breath, but his hopes that Fuller had just been searching the tree line and couldn't see him were dashed when he hunched over again and began loping toward him. An eager, hungry growl carried across the clearing. Nathan stepped out of the trees, aimed his weapon. Drop to the ground, Fuller. Get down or I will fire. The werewolf kept running, grinning, panting. Nathan squeezed the trigger. Blood sprayed the snow behind Fuller's left leg. Nathan hadn't missed, but the fucker kept on coming. Cold sweat trickled down the back of his neck, Nathan fired again, a torso shot that twisted Fuller to the side briefly before the bastard righted himself. If anything, he seemed to run faster. Nathan had time for one more shot. The chest was a bigger target than the head. The head was a kill shot. His next bullet ripped through Fuller's scalp and laid white bone open to the moonlight. He had hit skull but not brain, and the bastard didn't miss a step. Nathan stumbled back, searching for the tree branch. He'd get higher, defend himself from a better position. If he had time. Nathan didn't think he would. Fuller was too fast. He'd likely be dead in seconds. And knowing that filled him with rage, that after wasting so many fucking years, Emma was finally here and he'd have only one goddamn night with her before this werewolf pervert decided to rip the rest of his future away. 
So fuck climbing a tree. If Bullard decided to eat him, then Nathan would just have to shoot him from inside the bastard's mouth. Nathan set his feet, took aim. The fucker was almost on him. He had maybe one shot before. A dark form streaked across the clearing. So fast. Fuller either sensed or heard the wolf racing toward him and spun around just as Emma launched into the air. The heavy thud of flesh slamming into flesh cut off Fuller's surprised yelp. A wave of snow flew back from the impact of two bodies hitting the ground. Instantly, they were a tangle of snarling fur and skin and fangs. Nathan sprinted toward them. Growls filled the air, yips of pain that ripped at his heart, and he prayed that they were Fuller's, not Emma's. He couldn't fucking bear it if she was hurt. Relief blasted through him as the twisting battle came to a sudden halt, with Emma pinning Fuller on his back with her large forepaw pressing into his bloody chest. Her teeth were clamped over his throat. Apparently, five years' experience as a wolf had given her a hell of an advantage. Fuller wheezed, his eyes opening wide. He flailed at Emma with his right hand. The thumb was gone, but a tiny protrusion of pink flesh had already begun to grow in its place. Nathan aimed his weapon at Fuller's head. Don't move, Mark. Just stay still. Fuller obeyed, dropping his fists to the snow at his sides. His chest heaved as he tried to draw in air. His frantic gaze met Nathan's. Can't stop. We'll try to get you help, Nathan promised but he had a feeling that Fuller wouldn't be leaving this field. Madness filled the other man's eyes, and Nathan didn't trust that Fuller would stay down if Emma let him go. But he was staying down now, so Nathan asked, Did you kill those women, rape them, and leave them off the highway? As if in ecstasy, Fuller's eyes rolled back into his head. He ran his tongue over the grin that stretched his lips. They were so good. What more? Emma's snarl echoed Nathan's own rage. And what were you planning to do here? Fuller raised his right hand with its missing thumb. Knew you'd find fingerprints. Knew you'd stop me. I can't. Don't want to stop. Nathan shook his head in disbelief. No, he wouldn't have found a match. Fuller had never been charged or booked. His prints wouldn't have been in the system. Fuller's hips lifted and rocked. Emma shifted her grip on his throat. Fuller's voice rose an octave, took on a sing-song rhythm. But when I came to your house, I smelled her. Oh, Miss Liddy, Liddy, Liddy. Emma tightened her jaw, cutting off the sick refrain, but the bastard's hips continued to thrust up and down. Hold still. Nathan ordered. Fuller lowered his hand again, but his other hand moved beneath his waist, metal gleaming as he pulled out. Gun, Nathan shouted. Get back, Emma. Her jaws snapped down around Fuller's neck as she twisted away. The rip of flesh joined the blast of a gunshot. Emma yelped. Nathan shoved her to the side, stomped his boot into the bloody cavity she had opened in Fuller's throat. Nathan aimed between his eyes, and put the fucker down. Finally, Fuller's murdering spree was at an end. And Emma was... Nathan whipped around. Emma lay on the ground, blood saturating her fur and melting the snow beneath her. Emma! 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 He fell to his knees, lifted her head onto his lap, stroked his hands over her body. His heart crushed into nothing when he found the wound. A belly shot... That could only be bad. Really bad. Agony shredded his voice. Tell me you'll be okay. I know you heal fast. Please, Emma, I, I can't lose you now. Not now. You have to be okay. Bones snapped wetly inside her flesh. Her ribs bulged beneath his hands. Jesus Christ, Emma. Nathan tore out of his coat, covered her with it, and held her through the transformation. As soon as she lay panting and sweating in his arms, he said, I just meant for you to nod your head. She laughed breathlessly, showing him her pale stomach. Blood stained her skin, but the wound had vanished. Nice trick, huh? Everything heals when I change. Nathan's relief grabbed him by his throat, 
ripping away any response he might have had. He hauled her up, sealed her mouth with his kiss, let her feel every emotion rushing through him. Emma clung to him, returned everything he gave. And they hadn't said it yet, but he damn well knew what this was. Love. It had to be love. Nathan stood and swung her up against his chest, her bare legs dangling over his arm. They stared down at Fuller's body for a silent moment. Then Nathan began carrying her toward the house. They'd have to deal with Fuller, but not yet. Because after nearly losing Emma, Nathan had some other things to deal with first. So he gathered up his courage. So, in a little while, once we've got everything settled, maybe you'll take a risk with me. She lifted her head to look at him. Marry you? His stomach dropped, but there wasn't a bit of him that didn't like the idea. Well, that too. But I'm thinking more along the lines of, I want you to bite me. Surprised, dropped her mouth open. Bite you? Yeah. Nathan dropped a kiss under her full lips before adding, I'd like to run with you. Tears shimmered in Emma's beautiful eyes before she buried her face against his neck. Yes, she said. Of course it's yes. We can be our own little pack. Her tongue tasted the skin of his throat. Her teeth followed it with a nip. I'll bite you so hard, Nathan Forrester. Heat surged through his veins. Let me get you home first. I'm with you, she said softly. So I'm already home. Then he'd gladly spend the rest of his days keeping her with him, in his home, in his bed, in his arms, because he wasn't wasting any more time, not even a second, not for the rest of his life. So he began not wasting time by kissing her again. The End This has been Bite Me, written by Mel Jean Brooke, read by Joshua McRae. Welcome back. Hey, don't forget to enter this week's giveaway. It's the 10 signed paperbacks of The Kraken King. And also don't forget to go get Frozen on Kindle Unlimited by Mel Jean Brooke. And if you want something longer that's more like fantasy and fun but still hot as fuck, go check out Mel Vane in The Gathering of Dragons. Right. I'll make sure all that shit is linked in the show notes for you guys. And you can check out the new releases as well. <laughs> so anything else? I think that's it. Right. Wait, who I do guess. we have? Hold on. Who do we have next week before I forget? We ha oh, we have Sarah Reddy. I'm so excited. This is the one Eagle recommended us. She was so sweet. She's been so super nice and like excited to be on the podcast with us. So I'm really happy to have her. It's going to be right. fun. Then I guess tell them what to do. Fuck your day up. Make today your bitch. Don't be a dick. Bye, guys. Bye. Read me romance. Read, read me romance. Read me romance. Read, read me romance. You can